The origins of football in Africa can be traced to the far shores of 19th century Britain, where, during a sustained period of economic expansion, a vast empire had been forged. It was a time when their public schools were in the ascendancy, a time when sports and religion formed the core of a new moral code. For in the rough play of games were enshrined those values so cherished by the colonial elite, stolidity, teamwork and manly discipline. It was a doctrine that would permeate throughout the world as their graduates left school and set sail for the new worlds. The games playing system, called the games cult or the games ethos or athleticism, became part and parcel of the public school. And from there, of course, it spread throughout the empire as missionaries and teachers and administrators and soldiers went out into the empire and spread the message of the gospel of games. So you took the Bible and you took the cricket bat, or you took the Bible and you took the football, and you went out into these heathen places and you attempted to teach the boys to be Christian gentlemen. From the 1870s onwards, the so-called scramble for Africa began, bringing Europe's major powers into a conflict over colonial expansion. For the estimated 110 million Africans on the continent, the European intrusion brought about a profound change in their existence and generated no little misery. The arrival of European colonizers did, however, bring a less intimidating and highly desirable agent of social integration. The origin of football in Zambia started with the explorer Dr. David Livingston. It is said that when he came to Zambia, he brought three things. One, the Bible. Two, his medical kit. And three, a football. Thus started the Zambian football resolution. A similar experience prevailed throughout Africa as missionaries founded schools and encouraged local children to attend with the promise of sport and in particular football. Many were converted but not necessarily to Christianity. Along the gold coast of Ghana the diaspora continued, football's emissaries sowing the seed in the fertile minds of the African youth. When the colonialists first came here, um, you know they went to Cape Coast first, uh, of course, uh, and that was the seat of the government and uh, obviously introduced the game there. Then the idea started spreading along the coast, because that was where most of the colonialists first stayed. So it spread and uh, Karatso Folk uh, was formed in 1911. And uh, as you are aware, Karatso Folk now is the oldest existing team in Ghana. The seeds of Ghana's mighty oak were planted not by the English, but by a Jamaican teacher at the government boys' school in Accra. Having introduced the game to his boys in 1903, it soon became popular throughout the colony. Matches played on dirt pitches barefoot, balls made from paper, and string. If missionaries brought the game to the west and east of Africa, in the Arab north, soldiers won new converts. French legionnaires had introduced football to Morocco during the colonial wars, while football had been played in Egypt since the 1880s, when British troops kick-started the game in Cairo. Legendary sides, Al-Ali and Zamalek, were founded there in 1907 and 1911 respectively, making Egypt one of the world's oldest and best established football nations. International progress had been made on the back of independence, Egypt enjoying great success at the 1928 Olympic Games where they beat Turkey 7-1 before losing out to Argentina in the semi-finals. Egypt's inclusion at an international level was the exception and not the rule on the continent. 
independence giving them an autonomy undreamt of by most Africans. Outside, the early history of football was one of social control, the colonial regime accepting the game's usefulness in pacifying the local population. The colonists thought, not only in terms of benefiting the natives, but also in terms of benefiting themselves, because what they were engaged in was a process of socialization. They were attempting to create a colonial mindset, but a mindset of deference to superiority. And uh, as many have said, uh, this was extraordinarily successful. If the British had tolerated and indeed encouraged football in their colonies, other European masters were less enthusiastic. In Cameroon, the French imposed racial segregation. Contact between the ruling elite and their subjects was limited. At a sporting level, the separation was absolute. The supposed racial superiority of the white European was barely challenged on the continent. Ethiopia, independent since the days of the prophets, found itself exposed to the most aggressive form of colonial imperialism when in 1936 it was overrun by Mussolini's fascist troops. Merciless in their dealing with the local populace, it is perhaps surprising that the Italian occupation brought about a football revolution. The starting point was the formation of Ethiopian club side St. George, whose players were subject to an Italian regime that imposed strict segregation of the races, an act of apartheid that had a profound effect on their striker, Idnikachu Tesema. The colonial divide and rule policy, this he had to live through, and he never liked it. Uh, in those days, clubs were uh, formed on the basis of ethnic, uh, ethnic groups, religious groups, and uh, those were reason enough uh, to create problems, misunderstandings among different ethnic groups, different religious groups. In 1942, Ethiopia was liberated. Those Italians who remained in the capital may have expected retribution, but instead found themselves invited to play a match of reconciliation. Once the country was liberated, the youth under the leadership of Idnagacho finally uh, convinced the Italians uh, for a game, uh, St. George versus the Italian community here. And uh, that must be the turning point in Ethiopian football history. After that, uh, everybody started mixing, playing together. It was not a match between Italians only, Greeks only, Armenians only. It was a match among all races, religions, ethnic groups. Post-war Africa took advantage of the cessation of violence and began the task of building football anew. In the Arab North, a regional cup drew together a host of talented club sides and players. La Coupe d'Afrique du Nord, c'était une, une compétition qui réunissait tous les clubs d'Afrique du Nord. Alors il y avait l'Algérie, la Tunisie, l'Oranie à l'époque, le, la Constantinois et le Maroc. Cette compétition a servi à nous révéler. The popularity of football in the north was now unquestionable, making it the natural base for those wishing to organize the game at an international level. FIFA, football's governing body, stepped in. FIFA decided to have confederation for the colonies, and they said that that. Africa can form their African Confederation of Football and when they get that, they will be given a seat in the Executive Committee of FIFA. 
the Argentinian member said that we are going, we have got something to consider. Why are you giving Africa a seat? There is no football in Africa. It was an undeniable fact that the gulf between European and African football was a wide one. In 1954, Hungary's 12-0 humiliation of Egypt profoundly damaged Africa's meagre reputation. But the overriding belief was that no progress would be made on the continent till their teams played, lost and learnt at the hands of the European elite. At a meeting in Khartoum in 1957, the African Football Confederation, CAF, was born. It was a bold declaration of both African unity and independence. CAF maybe is the first Pan-African institution in Africa and it was established by only uh, three uh, African countries, in fact four to begin with. The three were Ethiopia, the Sudan and Egypt, and then there was South Africa. CAF decided to celebrate their foundation with an African Cup tournament, all four members bringing a side. However, for Fred Fell, the South African representative, it was a challenge he could not accept. Fell told CAF that racial segregation laws enacted in the 1950s meant South Africa could either send a white or black team, but not mixed. To those nations which had themselves only recently emerged from the toil of colonialism, South Africa's stance was indefensible. For Idnikachu Tesema, Ethiopia's representative, it was intolerable. His memory of the Italian colonial past in Ethiopia was vivid, so he refused. He said, if you cannot come with a mixed dress team, not only you'll be uh, eliminated from the first African Cup, but South Africa would not continue to be a member of the African Football Confederation. If you do not want to play with your blacks, how come you want to play with us blacks? South Africa were duly excluded, beginning a 30-year war between Tsemis Kaf and all those who trucked with apartheid. In the absence of South Africa, the First Nations Cup was a somewhat limited event. Ethiopia and Egypt contested a final which the North Africans won 4-0 confirming their status as the continent's most accomplished side. The Nations Cup was strengthened over the following years by the growing number of newly independent countries wishing to take part. African politics was high on the global agenda with the formation of the Organization of African Unity in 1963, putting the Pan-African sentiments of leaders such as Nkrumah of Ghana center stage. That the finals of the Nations Cup were hosted in and won by Ghana that year was a triumph for both the team and their president. Football, he believed, could be a model for African pride and unity. And in a successful Black Stars team, he had the supreme vehicle. And on this note of national joy, the Africa Cup Series for 1963 drew to an eventful close proving to the world that in unity, the African sportsman is a powerful, talented and inspiring force in the competitive world of sport. In the mid-1960s, Nkrumah wasn't alone in politicizing the football arena. CAF continued to be a staunch opponent of discrimination, opposing FIFA's allocation of one World Cup place between Asia and Africa. Both confederations subsequently boycotted the 1966 tournament, leaving Eusebio, Mozambican by birth, but playing for Portugal as Africa's symbolic representative in England. In 1965, a military coup brought the flamboyant, football-loving Joseph Desiree Mobutu to power in the Belgium Congo. Backed by the West, he set out a new vision for both his country and Africa, one that in many ways resembled the pan-Africanism of Nkrumah. He wanted to become the most African president, and he used the sport. 
pour faire sa campagne et sa publicité, tant mieux, mais pour nous ça réussit. Hein, parce que Mobutu s'était investi, ce n'était pas possible. Encouraged by Mobutu, Congo's teams prospered. And in 1967, Engelbert won the African Champions Cup, Africa's most prestigious club competition, against Ghana's Asante Kotoko. Domestic success assured, Mobutu now turned his attention to the national team. When the Leopards raced onto the field to win the final of the Africa Cup of the Nations in the presence of the Emperor of Ethiopia in Addis Ababa, the Congolese 11 had already chalked up three brilliant victories in a row in this marathon competition. What a magnificent team the Leopards are, owing so much the inspiration of President Mobutu. Within three years of assuming power, Mobutu's investment in the Leopards was rewarded with a hard-fought victory over the Ghanaian Black Stars in the 1968 final. The Egyptian referee blew the whistle for full time. The Congo team was new champion in Africa. Both the team and their sponsor basked long and hard in the glory of their victory. For Mobutu, it was the inevitable proof that he was indeed the natural leader in a post-independent Africa. He would succeed where Nkrumah had failed. Sport, he believed, would unify and pacify a population hungry for the good things. And in 1974, he fed that dream till it burst. Vous savez que vers les années 73 et les années 74, les Zaïr, actuellement, que le de moitié du Congo, était au top sur le plan économique. Il y avait beaucoup d'argent. L'économie marchait très bien. Rappelez-vous, c'est la même année, 74, il y a eu les championnats du monde de boxe ici à Kinshasa. Mohamed Ali et Georges Forman. Invited by Mobutu, Ali's arrival put Zaïr firmly on the map and advanced their shared ideology. Black Africans were ready to take on the world. I'm fighting Africa because I'm fighting in my homeland. America is not my original homeland. My original homeland is Africa. C'est la même année que le la RDC a gagné la Coupe des Nations en Égypte, a gagné la Coupe, a été allé à la Coupe du Monde. Donc c'était une année formidable. Notre succès de l'équipe nationale, dans les années 74, c'était dû à quoi C'était dû à la préparation. On s'est préparé longuement. Vous voyez ce que ça a donné comme résultat. Après la Coupe d'Afrique des Nations de football, on est sorti champion d'Afrique, médaille d'or. A packed airport greeted the Leopards on their arrival at Kinshasa International. The Zairean public, who had been denied any obvious role models during the colonial era, now latched onto the team and made it their own. Donc cette année-là, nous étions gâtés. On était champions d'Afrique et on est allé représenter l'Afrique à la Coupe du Monde. Quoi sans une grande motivation, mais ils ne pouvaient pas avoir l'illusion aussi de se dire nous allons à la Coupe du Monde pour gagner, non. Parce qu'au départ, ils se disent, ah, il y a le Brésil, bon, il y a l'Allemagne. Les gens avaient tellement peur de ces équipes-là. Bon, ils ont dit, non, écoute, on, on va y aller, on va jouer. Mais je crois qu'on on on leur avait demandé de ne pas être ridicule. Perhaps concerned, the authorities made an unusual squad selection. Sur décision des autorités, on a sélectionné tous les féticheurs de province. Les meilleurs féticheurs sont arrivés à Kinshasa. Ils étaient dans l'avion. Ils sont partis en Allemagne. I saw them traveling with people. They will bring all sorts of things, you know, uh, all sorts of bags, uh, uh, funny smells, and uh, planting. Uh, uh, a sort of onion here and there, you know, eat this or go and uh, go to the cemetery, do this and you know, bring the human bone or the, uh, all this. With the hopes of Africa and an ambitious president hanging over them, Zaire went into the first match with Scotland determined that they would not be embarrassed. We played very well because 
En arrivant à, à, en Allemagne, euh, on nous a promis de toucher les primes de, 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 primes de participation après les premiers matchs contre l'Écosse. On a très bien joué contre eux, parce que l'entraîneur de l'Écosse nous avait promis de nous battre à 11 à 0. On a, fait, euh, on a joué, euh, on a perdu euh, 2 à 0. C'était ça. J'étais très content vraiment. But the mood in the Zaire camp quickly turned to anger when the bonuses they had been promised failed to arrive. Oui, parce qu'on était sûr après le match de, de l'Écosse, on pouvait toucher notre prime de participation. Mais la, la veille du match, on nous a promis qu'il n'y a rien. Alors il y a eu les problèmes d'argent, toujours, les équipes africaines. Il y a eu la prime de la FIFA. Bon, les joueurs à l'hôtel, ils ont appris que bon, on avait donné beaucoup d'argent pour eux. Alors avant la Yougoslavie, ils ont exigé l'argent. Ils ont dit, ah, on nous a dit de donner l'argent. Ah non, il n'y a pas d'argent. Alors il y a eu un climat de méfiance. Les joueurs d'ailleurs, deux heures avant le match, ont refusé de jouer. Mais ils ont joué avec la détermination de ne pas s'engager. En fait, les matchs de la Yougoslavie, ils l'ont saboté. Ils n'ont pas voulu jouer et ils l'ont perdu. While some commentators chose to view Zaire's willfully inept performance as one of quaint African naivety, in reality they were, in effect, on strike. On ne voulait pas jouer. Si vous voyez les films, on ne voulait pas jouer. On marchait sur le terrain. C'était clair. Il faut, il faut visionner bien les films. C'était clair. Zaire lost 9-0, one of the heaviest defeats in the tournament's history. Their experience of the World Cup was in marked contrast to the parades and ticker tape of their Nations Cup victory. On avait tout mis à mort. Tout était oublié. Tout était tombé après la Coupe après la Coupe du Monde. On était tous tombés. Et je vais vous dire quelque chose. Nous sommes revenus de la Coupe du Monde. On n'a même pas trouvé l'accueil. Au retour, on n'a pas trouvé l'accueil. Personne à l'aéroport. Nous avons été ramassés par des taximens, c'est-à-dire des fanatiques qui nous aimaient. Et qui nous ont trouvé qu'on traînait à l'aéroport. Vous voyez, c'est cette réserve-là qui nous a été réservée. On pouvait peut-être, après la Coupe du Monde, aller évoluer en Europe, avoir des contrats dans des équipes européennes. Ça n'a pas été. Nous sommes revenus au pays. On était abandonnés. C'est la FIFA que nous, on tenait beaucoup. Parce qu'on savait bien qu'après la Coupe du Monde, un joueur qui a joué la Coupe du Monde doit être quand même quelque part riche. Même pas riche, mais noble. Mais nous, si vous arrivez à aller voir là où nous habitons, vous allez pleurer. Vous n'allez pas même pas accepter d'aller y vivre. Vous ne vivrez jamais dans ces conditions-là. Et c'était ça, et c'est ça. Je pense que c'est un réveil. Le Cameroun, s'il avait commencé aussi pour la première fois, certainement qu'il aurait eu des problèmes. Je pense qu'il faut qu'on pardonne quand même la RDC. Mais c'était une équipe sans expérience internationale, sans le niveau international, qui est tombée dans la cour de grand. Mais nous étions les premiers, nous étions les sacrifiés, mais nous avons ouvert la voie pour le continent africain, je crois. As a black majority fought for their freedom. Around the world, people horrified by the many atrocities of the government were calling for change. CAF, who had banned South Africa from their confederation in 1960, now campaigned for their immediate exclusion from FIFA. It was a stance that brought their strong-willed president, Tsema, into direct conflict with FIFA's English president, Sir Stanley Rouse. They perceived Sir Stanley Rouse as a colonial person with colonial views, who uh, didn't respect Africans. And they used this weapon against our Stanley Ross, and, uh, you know, the man has to go. Rouse's refusal to ban South Africa was to prove an ethical and professional mistake. As his challenger to the FIFA presidency, Joao Havelange, went to the Africans with a promise to ban South Africa and bring CAF to FIFA's high table. Avalanche came and said, look, 
I'm the liberator. I will be there. I will give you guys everything. I will give you money, you know, to organize yourself. I will send the Brazilian team to play against you. And in the 70s, when you say, I will bring Pele to play against you, wow, hallelujah, you know. The, 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 the dream of people. People want to see Pele. And I've learned, send the team to tour some African countries. And people will say, oh, the man, he may be genuine. And funny thing is, I've learned used to call Africans, I am one of you guys. So there then, I remember Tesema telling me that Emmanuel, he told us that he's one of us. And by, by being one of them, means that they must support him. With the backing of CAF, Havelange became FIFA's new president. South Africa were banned in 1976. Tesema had won a major victory for the battle against apartheid. <laughs> Having overcome their own battles with apartheid, Cameroon had emerged as a nation obsessed by football. In the late 1970s, Cameroon became the major force in African club football. Their success revolving around the three times African champions, Canon Yaoundé. En 82, l'équipe qui joue, disons, la Coupe du Monde, il y avait huit joueurs du Canon. Et dans, dans les huit joueurs, il y avait sept qui étaient titulaires. Ça prouve que on a dominé, disons, pendant une certaine période des années 80. Et le football camerounais et le football africain. At their training pitch overlooking the capital, a bright new generation of Canon superstars had indeed evolved. And with the addition of one or two extras, took Cameroon through to the 1982 World Cup. I think we had a very good team, very, very soudé. Une équipe de copains, une équipe d'amis. Et on avait envie, à cette première Coupe du Monde camerounaise, de, de prouver que le Cameroun fait partie aussi des, des grands pays du, du monde dans le football. Cameroon surprised everybody by playing out nil-nil draws with Peru and Poland in their first two matches. And went into their last match showing little of the nerves that hung over their opponents, the eventual winners, Italy. The Lions refuse to be intimidated. And when Graziani gave the Italians the lead, they immediately counted with a goal of their own. Mbida, the score of Cameroon's first ever goal at the World Cup. We will play against Peru, against Poland, and against Italy. We have done des matchs nuls. Et donc, euh, la suite logique voulait que, qualifié pour la Coupe d'Afrique des Nations à Abidjan en 1984, que le Cameroun donc, puisse euh, la remporter. Heureusement, le Cameroun a été euh, qualifié pour la finale et nous avons battu, euh, comme d'habitude un peu, le Nigeria hein, sur le score de 3 buts à 1. J'avais eu la chance de marquer le but décisif. Bien joué sur la game, ça Qui ça Très bien But du Nigeria Premier but du Nigeria Aoudou Shoot Organisation Quel coup de pied Abega En dribble Sur bas au centre, Abega Abega, toujours Abega, Mila, Mila, Abega! Cameroon were to build on this success, qualifying for the 1990 World Cup in Italy. Despite their strong performance in 1982 and Morocco's in 1986, 
FIFA refused to allocate extra places for African sides, a stance strongly opposed by CAF's new Cameroonian president. Avec preuve à l'appui, statistique à l'appui, nous avons demandé au président Avalanche d'accorder une place supplémentaire au football africain. Bon, il ne l'a pas fait pour 86, il ne l'a pas fait pour 90. So Egypt and Cameroon went to Italy as the sole representatives of a continent hungry for success, although for Cameroon it was a feast to which not all had been invited. En 1997, le Cameroun est parti en Coupe du Monde, dans des conditions d'ailleurs euh, assez difficiles. D'abord, on ne savait pas si Roger Mila allait participer ou non. À la fin, ça me mettait une décision pratiquement inspirée par le président de la République. J'avais décidé d'arrêter de, de, avec l'équipe nationale de, de Cameroun. Et même étant toujours en, en activité, Heureusement pour moi, le président avait, il avait surtout insisté, même pas insisté, mais il avait surtout donné un ordre au ministre de la des Sports pour que je fasse partie de cette équipe nationale. But Miller's inclusion wasn't music to everyone's ears. Cameroon's Soviet coach found himself at the center of a player revolt, as the captain, Joseph Antoine Bell, announced he would quit if Miller was in the team. Joseph Antoine Bell était peut-être de mauvaise foi. Comme il disait que moi j'étais âgé, que je ne pouvais plus jouer, il avait oublié que lui-même il avait été âgé. Il n'y avait que deux années qui nous, qui nous séparaient entre euh, Joseph Antoine Bell et moi. Bell lost the fight. Miller was in. With morale undermined and world-class opponents waiting in the wings, Cameroon's prospects seemed at best tarnished, at worst fatally flawed. All the predictions were that Argentina would get a basket of goals against Cameroon. And uh, one of our reporters, that is uh, an African reporter, met me and said, what kind of team are you presenting here? Argentina will kill us. Because now it became like, you know, a continental affair. It was no longer a Cameroonian affair. So the, the African journalists were so concerned about the team that had been, had been, had, had, had been put to play. And then I, they, I told them, don't you worry. We know how to do these things. We're going to beat Argentina by just one goal. Uh, and he said, I, I doubt it very much. I'm, I'm afraid to go to the stadium. The Cameroonians had to take it to the Argentines. Because if they waited for the Argentines to play their game, there was no way Cameroon was a match for Argentina. But then the Cameroonians had to stop. They had to use every measure to stop the Argentines from moving. There was a little bit of indiscipline in terms of play, but uh, at least a uh, motive was, uh, was achieved, and uh, I think uh, that's, the credit goes to them. But it was for us, I wouldn't say it was a match of revenge, but it was for us a match very important, because the entrepreneur of Argentina had treated our footballers as a man of the lapin, and we wanted to prove that we were not the lapin, que nous étions des, des véritables Camerounais. Oman Biek gave the indomitable Lions a lead they refused to surrender. It was a result that shook the world champions, but not a Cameroonian side full of confidence. Euh, grâce à Dieu, on a fait un bon match, on a gagné contre l'Argentine. Et moi, j'avais déjà dit à, à ceux qui, qui doutaient que si on gagnait l'Argentine, on pouvait aller au deuxième tour. In Kono's prophecy fulfilled, Cameroon went into a second round match against World Cup enigmas, Colombia. The star of the game was a rejuvenated journeyman, a 38-year-old striker reborn. Euh, J'ai dribblé trois joueurs, et avant de me retrouver devant un guitare, pour le battre de pied gauche, je pense que c'était une action d'éclat, de, une nation de, 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 de grandeur, une nation de, 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 de vraiment de grands joueurs. 
His goal led to a celebration that would become one of the images of the 1990 World Cup, the Miller Wiggle. Miller's second goal sealed Cameroonian victory and announced the arrival of Africa as a football power. He presented that image of that freedom of the African, the freedom of spirit of the African, which I believe we use even in the way we play football, freedom. At this stage of the competition, we didn't have any fear of anyone. On aurait pu rencontrer, que ce soit l'Allemagne, le Brésil ou l'Argentine à ce stade de compétition. Nous étions gonflés à beaucoup. On avait vraiment un gros cœur. On avait envie de, de, de prouver quelque chose. Against England, Cameroon went 1-0 down. But then scored two second half goals to take a lead few thought possible. Then, the indiscipline that marked their match with Argentina returned to haunt them, and two England penalties ended the African dream. Despite this defeat, Cameroon had erased all memory of Zaire's 1974 humiliation, and in the process gave football its first African superstar. Roger was never a hero before 1990. He was a good player. Everybody recognized that. But 1990, the tables turned for Roger Miller. And why? Because of his age. Nobody could believe that somebody his age could do the things he did and with such skill and dexterity. And consequently, people looked upon him. He became like a leader, became a symbol of Cameroonian football and later on, of course, African football. And his praises were sung almost everywhere. Their eyes opened. Football scouts from all over the world descended on Africa. And since then, a steady flow of young players have been spirited away, sold on the promise of a better life. When you go to our playgrounds, they're almost empty. Because as soon as anybody shines around here, he moves away. There are so many hawks all over the place. Everybody is trying to grab one good player, one good chicken to go roast somewhere else. And, and that's what has happened. For most players, the European leagues offered financial rewards unimagined in their own countries, but at a price. Racism proving the darker side of the African experience. It wasn't easy. Sometimes you train and then your own colleagues tell you you are a black man and you should go back to your country and uh, sometimes they spat on you and you know. So you go through a lot of um, hard, hard situations. But that makes you stronger. And when you continue making them to win, then you get a place in their hearts. And when you get a place in their heart, then they even think of making you even the captain or their leader. So you can see the tremendous changes from uh, saying you are black, spitting on you, and then you become the, the captain of the team. You know, uh, I think there is nothing to achieve when you start achieving your, the heart of your own people, you know, when it comes to football. While black Africans were making a name for themselves in Europe, the North Africans were conspicuous by their absence. Strong domestic leagues, limited professionalism, and a Muslim culture that precluded easy integration kept transfers to a minimum. But at an international and domestic level, they excelled. North African sides had made a significant impact on the World Cups and at a continental level had dominated winning six Nations Cups and a host of continental trophies. At the heart of this success was a well-financed football structure that resembled those in Europe. It was a model few sub-Saharan countries could match. 
seemingly unhindered, sub-Saharan teams such as Nigeria and Cameroon began to dominate the continent in the 1990s. The 1994 Nations Cup, won by Nigeria on Tunisian soil, confirmed the power shift from the north to the south. After their Nations Cup triumph, Nigeria went to the World Cup in America and challenged, as Cameroon had done, European and Latin American dominance of the tournament. Nigeria qualified top of their group and in the second round match played Italy, who they led till the 82nd minute. We are like playing against Italy, which we are leading, and then suddenly they come back and uh, uh, won the game. But um, if you see the games, you will know that Nigeria really showed that they are a strong country in terms of football and uh, we have the players, we have the qualities and we can go more further than what we did. Nigerian promise was realized two years later when they won Olympic gold at the Atlanta Games. In the early 90s, South Africa had emerged from the wilderness. With apartheid no more, thoughts turned to reconciliation. Football proved to be the mediator as a nation rallied around a team reborn and an inspirational leader. This country needed something to believe in. And what helped tremendously was that we had our first president, Nelson Mandela, which became a rallying point, a point of convergence, a point that helped the nation to grow and build together. And so the national team became helping to strengthen that pillar around which everyone could rally, both black and white in the country. Bound together by a common cause, South Africa hosted and won the 1996 Nations Cup. To many fans, it was a dream that had long seemed impossible. It was like a book written for us. Uh, you know, home soil uh, with Nelson Mandela being there and, you know, everything just went according to plan in the competition. It was certainly a great triumph for the country and uh, one that sort of woke up the world that South Africa had arrived, I suppose. In that team, we had black, white and every other player that represented the entire spectrum of the South African nation and that that team became successful by winning the African Cup of Nations helped us to accelerate the process of integration making every South African feel and recognize as part of the South African nation. After more than a century of football, the fight for independence was complete. Although on the pitch, African teams were still struggling to overcome European superiority. Five teams, two more than in 1994, competed at the 1998 World Cup. Nigeria shone again, beating Spain in the first round. People know that you know how to play, but they don't know what is going to happen until the final whistle is blown. If it's a, a good day for us, nobody's going to beat us. Ultimately, Nigeria beat themselves. Having qualified top of their group, they were rocked by money problems and demotivated crashed out against Denmark. I can't really say what happened, but I know there was a problem going on in the camp and um, everybody knew about that before the day of the day. The next day is going to be the game and uh, we have the players and everything. But if those things were not put in the right way, it's going to affect the team, no matter who you are. They were naive against Denmark. They would have beat Denmark easily. But because they spent hours uh, negotiating their bonuses, they lost their concentrations, their mind are on the money, and when they went to the stadium, the match is gone. It's gone. Despite such disappointments, 
Some see Africa's struggles as part of an evolutionary process that will one day see them dominate the game. Every day we keep on growing. We keep on getting stronger and stronger. So I believe in the years to come, you will see more and you believe in Africa we at least be on the map again. Although the reservoir of talent is undeniable, its passion beyond question, Africa's inability to organize itself at the highest level threatens future growth. Next up, long-suffering pillion riders